Father in heaven, we just thank you that we can come into your presence. We come in the name of Jesus, your son. We thank you that he is our intercessor and that he is the way to the Father. Father, we thank you for the gift of eternal life and this life is in your son. We honor you and your son. We thank you that you gave your only begotten son that we might have eternal life. Lord, I pray for your spirit to loosen my tongue, that I may speak words that will bring blessing, words that will encourage, uplift, and bless the people of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For anyone who is a student of Bible prophecy as a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, they will know that uh, our system of belief is built upon several lines of prophecy. We are a movement that have come out of the prophecies in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, and then into Revelation. Revelation chapters 13 and 14, and of course all through Revelation, we are a prophetic movement that brings together all of Scripture. There's one thing that uh, can cause, uh, I guess, a sense of being overwhelmed when you start to study this message. When you see, when you go, as it were, into the basement of this structure and you examine the, the, the bolts and the nuts and the frame and everything and the way that it works, you can be overawed by the structure. And you can, you can be lost for years in certain aspects of this framework, this system of, of belief. Uh, and the structure is very, very important. It's very, very important. But we must always remember that this structure this system which brings together all of Scripture as its own interpreter and unveils for us a prophetic framework, all of this is for the purpose of holding one stone, as it were. And that is the precious stone, that is the cornerstone. We can think of it as in a structure that supports the stone, but then at the same time the stone is the cornerstone which supports the entire structure. Either way you look at it, the system is developed to come to a central point. And what is that point? Jesus Christ. I guess the common text that comes to our mind is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a, a familiar text for us. And it says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the central theme of the Advent message. Christ and Him crucified. And people would say, well, we know this. We know this. We know Christ and Him crucified. The most important text that many people believe in Scripture. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But sometimes it's easy to lose sight of that central theme because of the immensity of the structure. And sometimes we can be put in a position where if we were asked a question, what is the core of your message? What is one line that you would would sum up what your message is about. Is it the elaborate system of the sanctuary with its colours and its sacrificial system? Is that the central theme? Well, it's an important theme, isn't it? The central pillar and foundation of our faith is the declaration under 2,300 days, then shall a sanctuary be cleansed. It's a central pillar. It's something that's important. But of course we know that the sanctuary, thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. But who is the way? Jesus Christ. 
Jesus said, I am the way. So the sanctuary points to Christ. And all of these things are built to point to that one person, Jesus Christ. When we think about a message within the Advent movement that is the most important message, I think many Adventists, when they think of a most precious message, a most important message, many who know Advent history, their minds go to a book called Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92, and these are the words that they begin to think of. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This, of course, is the 1888 message. The message of Christ and his righteousness. So it was a message that was determined not to know anything other than Christ and him crucified. But as we all know, those words have to be built upon a framework. They have to be built to give true meaning and impact to the words. What is Christ and him crucified? What does it mean to have Christ in you, the hope of glory? What do these things mean as we allow the message to unfold? Let's continue to read what the prophet said. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Saviour, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith. What is justification through faith? Other than the assurance of sins forgiven? The assurance of eternal life. Isn't that what justification is? We could go into all the elaborate details and the fineness of what that means, but to be justified by faith is to have your sins washed away and have the assurance of eternal life. So it presented justification through faith in the surety. It was sure. This is what the message brought. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which was made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. It invited the people to take the righteousness of Jesus, and that righteousness, of course, was an had an obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person. So it was a message that directed the mind to the divine person of Jesus Christ. An interesting message. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. This is the most precious message. It pointed God's people to the divine person of Jesus Christ. It pointed them to his merits, to his unchanging love for the human family. This was the message. And what is the key to this message? I want to read you something from the book Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, which is written by one of the men who gave that message. And this is A.T. Jones, and uh, it's in, on page 17. I want you to listen carefully to this. We're looking at the key to the message as pointing to the divine person of Jesus. What is this key? Christ's likeness to God as set forth in the first chapter of Hebrews is only introductory to the setting forth of his likeness to men as in the second chapter of Hebrews. Now catch that thought. Did you catch it? Christ's likeness to God as set forth in the first chapter of Hebrews is only introductory to setting forth his likeness to men 
in the second chapter of Hebrews. So our perception of the likeness of Christ to God in the first chapter of Hebrews lays down the platform for Christ having a likeness to men in the second chapter of Hebrews. Here we see the key from one of the messengers of a most precious message. Let me go on. Page 17. His likeness to God, as in the first chapter of Hebrews, is the only basis... What? The only what? Basis. The only basis of true understanding of his likeness to men, as in the second chapter of Hebrews. The only basis for understanding what Christ is like in terms of his likeness to men is to understand what Christ is like in his likeness to God. In the building, it's the foundation. It's the foundation. So as we observe how he is like God, we will learn how he is like man. And as we bring those two together, it will open a fountain of life for us. This was the most precious message that was given to Jones and Wagner. And the question we may go on and, and read, but the question is, how, what is the likeness? How is this likeness obtained? Let me read to you what both of these messengers said about how in chapter 1, how the likeness to God was obtained by Jesus Christ. This is uh, on page, back in page 14, because the chapters of Wag, uh, Jones's book in Consecrated Ways, uh, it speaks about such a high priest, consider him who is a high priest, then it goes to Christ as God, Christ as man, and then it goes on from there. So we're looking at Hebrews chapter 1, Christ as God, Hebrews chapter 2, Christ as man, and this is the centre of the message. Notice then that uh, what he says, how this likeness is obtained. Uh, I think we back up a bit. Back on page 13. Next, of the Son of God himself we read, who being the brightness of his, God's glory, and the express image of his, brackets, God's person, the very, and then he, in brackets he says, the very impress of his substance, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This tells us that in heaven the nature of Christ was the nature of God. That he in his person, in his substance, is the very impress, the very character of the substance of God. And everyone, of course, will be saying, Amen. Of course, this is so. This is true. Because Christ is God. Let him continue. That is to say that in heaven, as he was before he came to the world, the nature of Christ was the very substance, the nature of God. And all of us can say, Amen. Let him continue. Therefore, it is further written of him that he was made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This more excellent name is the name God. So how did he obtain this likeness to God? By what? Inheritance. inheritance. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This more excellent name is the name God. He inherited the name God. He inherited the substance of God. He inherited the nature of God. And this is the basis upon which we will understand how he has a likeness to man. His likeness to God was by inheritance. So great was his likeness to God, so full was his inheritance, that it could be said that he is God. That when he speaks, he speaks as God. Because the inheritance is so complete. He is so fully representative of the Father that we can say, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that when he speaks, we hear the voice of God because of the inheritance. Thus, let, let me continue. Thus, 
He is so much better than the angels as God is better than the angels. And it is because of this that he has a more excellent name, the name expressing only what he is in his very nature. And this name he hath by inheritance. It is not a name that was bestowed, but a name that is inherited. Is A.T. Jones making the point clear? Am I making the point clear? It was by inheritance. Notice E.J. Wagner in his book, Christ and His Righteousness. This name, the name God, was not given to Christ in consequence of some great achievement, but it is his by right of inheritance. Speaking of the power of and greatness of Christ, the writer to the Hebrews says that he is so much better than the angels because he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. A son always rightfully takes the name of the Father. And Christ, as the only begotten Son of God, has rightfully the same name. A son also is to a greater or lesser degree a reproduction of the Father. He has to some extent the features and personal characteristics of his Father. Not perfectly because there is no perfect reproduction among mankind, but there is no imperfection in God or in any of his works. And so Christ is the express image of the Father's person. Hebrews 1.3, as the son of the self-existent God, he has by nature all the attributes of deity. Christ and his righteousness, page 11 and 12. Divine. So Christ inherited all the Father has. And so fully imbued was that inheritance, so exact that when we look at Christ, we see God himself, for God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That express image, to be an express image means to be an exact copy. That means Christ is identical. He's, he's not identical to the Father. He's an identical copy of the Father. Many would today say that he is identical to the Father. They are exactly the same from their own resources and their own. But this is not the message that was given to us in 1888. It was a likeness to God on the basis of inheritance. Inheritance. Now, it's upon this basis that we lay down in chapter 1 of Hebrews that, that Jones and Wagner introduce his likeness to man. And I want to read to you the chapter headings that follow Christ as man. He has a chapter for each of this. Next, he, he speaks of he took part of the same. He was made under the law. That's chapter 5. Chapter 6, made of a woman. Chapter 7, the law of hereditary. Chapter 8, in all things like. Over and over and over, we are presented with the reality that Christ, as he took all things from the Father, so Christ took all things from man. Let's read in Hebrews chapter 2, what did he take? We don't need to be in any doubt about what Christ inherited from mankind because it tells us, it says, Verse 14, 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, what is Paul doing? He, why did, and, and Jones goes into this, he, he also, he also himself, he also himself likewise, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why does Paul go to such extreme measures? What is he trying to say? That he became one of us. That he took upon himself our nature, your nature, my nature, with all of its liabilities, with all of its tendencies. He took it upon himself. So that in verse 16 it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. 
Abraham. Verse 17, wherefore in how many things? All things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Now, I want you to think about something here at this point. Because Christ inherited all the fullness of the deity, he was authorized to speak directly on behalf of God as God. As is presented to us in the book of Hebrews, because he took upon himself all that is man, everything that is of man he took into himself, he could represent the human race so that whatever God would speak to him, he was so fully identified with us that in God speaking to him, God is speaking to us. Do we see that? If, if the inheritance of Christ is of a type that he did not inherit all that we partake of, if he did not partake himself also likewise of the same, if he is different to us in some measure in taking that upon himself, can he fully represent us? No, no he cannot. So that when God would speak to him as a man, would God speaking to him bring me any comfort? It cannot bring me comfort unless I fully believed that Jesus took upon himself my nature, unless he was made after the likeness of men, taking upon him the seed. So that as it says, let us remember, what was the core of this message? Let me again take you back on page 17. His likeness to God, as in the first chapter of Hebrews, is the only basis of true understanding of his likeness to men in the second chapter. We will never deny that Christ has all the fullness of the Godhead. Anyone who denies that denies the scripture. But in taking this by inheritance, we see also that Christ inherited all the fullness of man in order to speak on behalf of man and also to be spoken to by God as man on our behalf as the second Adam. Praise God. So what the Father speaks to him is spoken to us in order that, think about it this way, that Christ becomes the lightning rod for the power of God to bolt through him everything that he wants to say to us. And this is where the message becomes powerful. This is where the heart of this message finds its mark because it's in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. Because here we find the Father speak to the Son as a man. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. As he speaks this word, remember, he is speaking to one who is fully authorized to represent the human race. He is the second Adam. And these words, because he took our nature upon himself, he is fully authorized to dispense to us as his brethren. This is the word that was spoken and low a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That word was spoken to a man who has all of my liabilities, who has my nature taken upon himself. A man with my nature, a man with my liabilities, has heard the voice of God say to him, You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I delight. Do we see that in the person of Christ, in our perception, in our understanding of the person of Christ, we will determine the measure of our own inheritance. Can we see that? 
that those words there, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If we believe in any way that Christ is different to us, then we would or we believe that Christ possessed his godhood of himself. Then we would say, well, of course, God would say that to him. How does that apply to me? There's no connection. There's no connection because he's God in his own right. He came in the form of a man. And this is the point. And I make this point in my manuscript, The Return of Elijah, chapter 20. We will not have this man reign over us. I make this point very clearly. If Christ has only taken the title son, but is not actually a son of God, but has taken that as a title, then that means by the same definition that Jones gives to us, the likeness of God that we perceive in chapter 1 of Hebrews becomes the likeness to God that we perceive in chapter 2 of Hebrews. And what do we find amongst Adventism today? All the leading brethren within Adventism deny that Christ took the nature of Adam after the fall. That is entirely consistent with what they believe about Christ taking the nature of God. It is a metaphor. Son of God is a metaphor to them. Therefore, son of man is a metaphor. Therefore, the words of God, you are my beloved son, is metaphor. It has no grip in it. There's nothing to hold on to because it's all a mirage. It's not real. The inheritance has been stripped away by a false understanding of who Jesus is. But when we see that Christ is the express image of the Father, inheriting everything from the Father, then we see that he is made of the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, that he is able to succor us who are tempted. He brings me comfort because his feet touch the ground. The ladder that reaches to the Father reaches to the very ground where I stand. It is not three or four rungs up. It is in the very ground. It is of the very clay that I am made of. So that there is a direct link between God and man, and that is Christ and him crucified. When we understand by inheritance, he is able to fully represent God and to speak on behalf of God. And then we Understand on that basis that he is fully man and is able to take and receive from God all that God would give to man as our second Adam that we can inherit from him even as he inherited from the Father. And this is exactly what Ellen White says. Desire of Ages, page 113. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, embraces humanity. How does it embrace humanity? We ask the question, how does it embrace? In reality or in metaphor? If we believe that Christ is the second person of the Trinity and that he adopts the title of the word son, Son of God, then he can only adopt the title of the word Son of Man. He is not in actual fact the Son of Man. He cannot, in fact, be tempted in all points like as we are. And as one Adventist scholar tried so elegantly to express it, when we talk about likeness, that Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, likeness is not sameness. As was said by one Adventist scholar, in the 80s, in the 70s. That is entirely consistent with the belief in the Trinity. Christ is only a metaphor in terms of being a son, both of God and of man. But this was not the message that was given to Jones and Wagner, the most precious message that pointed God's Advent people to the divine person of Jesus Christ. The only way possible for the words of the Father at the baptism can apply to us is if Jesus is fully our representative. Do you understand what I'm saying? He is not authorized to, to receive from the Father his blessing, his approval and his acceptance as a man unless he is fully man. He cannot do this. Unless we would say that, yes, he can do this for all the men who were like Adam before the fall. And how many of them were around? None. 
So what benefit is it to us? None. But he took upon himself. So as it says here, God spoke to Jesus as our representative. Take the, micro, the microscope, put the person of Jesus, the bone and marrow of Hebrews chapter 2 under the microscope. What kind of representative is he? He took upon himself all that man is of the seed of Abraham. He is fully endorsed to represent me, not only in the intellectual sense, but in the sense of my heart. My heart goes out to him. I feel after him because I sense that he knows how I feel. He knows what it is to wrestle with sin, to have temptation pounding into your mind, to feel the clamors of the flesh. Yes, he was more than man because he is the Son of God, but He took upon Himself, His divine person, all of my nature. Yes, He is more than what I am, but He is what I am. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Because He took all of what I am upon Himself. So He is all of what I am and more that enables His hand to grasp the Father. Because if He was not more, there would be nothing to grasp. Because He would be like only like me and I don't want him to be only like me but I want him to be enough like me to represent me to the Father in heaven and this is the good news with all our sins and weaknesses we are not cast aside as worthless he hath made us accepted in the beloved Ephesians 1 6 the light which fell from the open portal Portals upon the head of our Saviour will fall upon us as we pray for help to resist temptation. The voice which spoke to Jesus says to every believing soul, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. She could only write that on a basis of understanding what this most precious message was. And did she understand that message? Yes, because this, what she wrote here, was released in 1898. With that which was spoken here was done 10 years earlier. She understood the message that Christ could speak on our behalf, even as he, as the Son of God, could speak on his behalf. He was fully authorized to speak because he inherited all. We can go over and over, but this is the core of our message. This is the most precious message. We will not understand it unless we understand who Jesus is, that he is Son of God, by inheritance, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and that he is son of man, by inheritance, all the seed of Abraham bodily. In one man, he brings the two together as the intercessor, the lightning rod for God to speak through, so that when I hear the word spoken to Jesus, it's as he is speaking directly to me, so that as we see in John 1 chapter 12, on the basis of understanding this, that in speaking to Christ as the Son of Man, that everything that God says to him, he says to me. And what do I derive from that? Adrian, you are my son. I am accepted in the beloved. In the reality of who Jesus is, is the reality of my acceptance. I know that I am blessed. I know that I am accepted. I know that I am loved. I know that my Father delights in me. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of Man. Why? Because Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore, I'm no longer a servant, but a son. Jesus has opened a channel for us. And I say again, you will never understand that kind of freedom until you know who Jesus is in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. It was given to us in a most precious message that pointed us to the divine person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? You will not see this message anywhere else preached because it could only come to a people who would truly see that Christ is the Son of God by inheritance. And the Son of Man by inheritance. There is no other church that comes anywhere near to believing that Jesus took the liabilities of our sinful nature. That is denied. Because within the Trinity, it's all metaphor. He cannot be in any way. The Greek philosophical view of sin and mortal flesh must be separate from sinners. 
And so that's lost in, in all of those things. This most precious message will go forward with great power. This is the message of Revelation 18, a recognition of Christ as the Son of God. This is who the disciples preached that Christ was the Son of God, the Son of Man. That was the message of 1888. Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the great go-between who has obtained for us helpless individuals, our, our helpless human beings, he has, he has received at the baptism on our behalf a blessing. Wasn't that, that what Esau cried for? Bless me, Father, bless me. Is there not a blessing for me? Yes, there is a blessing for us in the person of Jesus Christ, for we are accepted in the Beloved. A most precious message. So when we are asked, what is the heart of the Adventist message? Well, it is to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. It is John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And what is that name? Son of God. Son of Man. If we believe on that, then we will receive all that he delights to share with us. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. How can we have the mind of Christ unless he comes down to where we are, to embrace all that we are? And then he can lift us up to God. He must be fully inherit all that we are, so that he can give to us the full inheritance that he has received and he can share it with us. It's a beautiful message. And of course, in closing, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. This is the message that will go to the world with great power. The world will awaken to realize that this Son who is in the likeness of God, has received on our behalf the Father's blessing acceptance and that within the heart of Jesus is a spirit of submission, trust and obedience which is ours through him. We receive it from him in order that we may be submissive, trusting and obedient and that we may be his beloved children in whom he is well pleased. It's a beautiful message. And so, as it says, I determined to know nothing among you save Christ. The question today is, which Christ? A Christ that possesses all that he has from within himself? Or a Christ that the Bible reveals who received everything he has by inheritance? Both inheriting all from God and inheriting all from man in order to be that lightning rod through which all the blessings of God can flow. Let's kneel. Father in heaven, I know that I can come with boldness to you through Jesus, your son, for Jesus is my representative. He is able to succor us who are tempted, for he took part of my nature, our nature, and he's able to fully represent you, Father. So, Lord Jesus, in coming to you, I know that you fully represent the Father, for you are all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that in you I am accepted by the Father. I thank you, Father, that in confessing the name of your only begotten Son, that you accept me as your Son, that you extend to me your hand, that I can see your smile, towards me because I can see your hand and your smile extended to your son and therefore I have inherited that. We can inherit this. We are accepted by you through Christ. Through this Christ you inherited all things. We thank you in Jesus' name.